the week. Uh, let's all try to keep up with this. And uh, of course, as we read the Bible each day, it gives us uh, understanding of what God is trying to say to us. Along with the Bible reading, two Bible memory verses will be given each week. And there is going to be a competition at the end of each term. So let's turn inside to the Bible memory. Let's read together. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Matthew 20, 15. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money, or are you envious because I am generous? Okay, the Grace Course uh, started um, last week, so any of those who are still contemplating whether to come, there's still time, so please come and join the Grace Groups, um, Thursday evenings at 7.30 and Friday morning at 10 o'clock. Um, so let's all pray that we can get a wonderful um, spiritual blessing from this uh, grace course. Teachers meetings, uh, today there is a youth group meeting at 11.15 and next week at 1 o'clock the nursery group. Services at Carter House will continue in February and the next one is the 27th. Holy Week Fasting Conference in Germany is coming up now as always, Monday the 15th to Thursday the 18th of April. The venue is as always it has been. Um, so let's pray, even though we don't go to that, maybe some of us uh, don't, so let's just pray that that will be a wonderful blessing uh, as it is each year. Um, as always again, look at the service rotor sheet in the fellowship room. Uh, and as the Lord leads you to uh, serve for refreshments, washing up and cleaning. The Saturday outreach, as always, 2.30 to 4 is either at uh, Wimbledon or Kingston. Okay, so let's concentrate now on the reading, which is Luke 4, verses 16 to 30. Luke 4, 16 to 30. And let's all read this together. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Do hear, do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent of any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sihon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Amen. So now I'll pass you to Pastor. Okay, we have the pop on the, um, on the screen. Yes. Okay, good morning, children. Uh, it's great to see you this morning. I want to buy. I want to begin by uh, telling you a story about my sister. 
I got two sisters, younger sisters in Korea. And uh, the older one, the older one among those two, she used to go to church like yourselves uh, every every Sunday, very regularly. And uh, she was very active. She went to the uh, uh, in the services, Bible studies, meetings, and you know, all kinds of all kinds of meetings in the church for many many years, in the uh, secondary, in the high high school. But after she went to the university, uh, after a while, she stopped going to church altogether. Uh, and then that continued for many more years to come. So last time I saw her, she didn't still go to church. So. Obviously, it was very disappointing for me, you know, uh, my own sister, who used to go to church very regularly, very, very dedicated. And, you know, she was one of the most uh, uh, active uh, young people in the church. But after going to the university, somehow she dropped. You know, there was parties, there was friends, uh, you know, there were other things that really, uh, perhaps to her, more interesting. So it is really, for me personally, uh, heartbreaking, really heartbreaking. Somebody who used to go to church, but you know, after joining the university, uh, stopped going anymore. Now, my sister is not an uh, unusual case. I know there are many, many situations, many, many cases. In fact, you know, our church, you know, just uh, just across the road, uh, many people after secondary school when they go to university in London or in Birmingham or you know, whichever university they go, uh, after joining university, a lot of them, they stop going to church. They stop following Jesus. They stop uh, worshiping God, reading the Bible, and uh, living as a Christian. And uh, they find something else more interesting, more fun, uh, you know, with friends and uh, 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 life as a university student. One of the reasons why that happens is because for them, a lot of them, Christianity, the Bible, God, and Jesus, they were so familiar with all those things. You know, the Bible, Sunday, Bible, Sunday school, youth group, Bible study, prayer meeting, Sunday service, and, and songs, and all those songs. They were so familiar, they were so familiar with all those Bible stories, that perhaps, they didn't really have that intimate relationship with Jesus. So they knew about Jesus, they knew about God, they knew about uh, you know, what it means to, to follow, to worship Jesus, but they didn't really know Jesus as a person. They didn't really know God as a person. So there's a huge difference between when you just when you are familiar with about all the Christianity and all the Bible stories, and when you actually know when you actually know Jesus. Huge difference. When you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior every day of your life, of course you will continue to follow Jesus. You know, not only in university, but after university, you know, whichever job you, you, you get, you will continue to serve uh, Jesus and follow Jesus and worship Jesus and love Jesus. That's what you want to do. But if you're only familiar, uh, you know, at this point, you are, you know, you, you, you are children, perhaps maybe sometimes you are forced to come to church if you don't want to come to church. Sunday morning, you I, I want to sleep more, I want to play football, I want to watch the television, you know, I want to play a game. So you have, a, you have other things that you want to do. But sometimes you are forced to come to church. You have no choice because your parents want to go to church. But when you have your own choice, when you are old enough, uh, you know, for example, in your university, then it's easy to make that choice to go away from church and go away from, oh, I don't, I don't want to read the Bible anymore. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to come to church anymore. I want to do other fun things. Okay. So that is very important. Now, one day, as we read this story, Jesus came to uh, Nazareth, his hometown. So, you know, he grew up in Nazareth. So everyone knows each other. This is a small town, okay? And uh, so they were friends of Jesus. They used to play together. So this is a very familiar 
uh, 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 territory. Okay, and so he came to the uh, synagogue. They used to come to synagogue. We come to church now, but they used to go to synagogue. So Jesus came to this synagogue. And uh, so he stands up. Go to the next one, please. He stands up and he was given a scroll. Now we had a Bible book, but in those days they had a scroll. Okay, so he was given a scroll uh, to read. So he just starting reading uh, this scroll and he, the, he was found uh, Isaiah 61. Very uh, significant passage in the Old Testament, Isaiah 61, and it says, uh, it says uh, this: The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to tell the good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now. She just deliberately chose that passage, and in reading that passage, he's really saying, well, I am the one the Bible is talking about, so I'm here to preach the good news to the people. I'm here to give freedom uh, to people. I, I, I'm here to heal the blind, the deaf, the mute, and I'm here to set people free. Whatever oppression they were under, I'm here to set them free, okay? So that's why that's why Jesus chose this particular scripture, which is uh, which is scripture uh, talking about the Messiah who is going to come. When he comes, he's going to do. So he's really answering that. Okay. So I'm here to achieve all those things. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. I am the Christ that people have been waiting for so long. So that was the statement he's making. And so after reading that, he sat down. Uh, go to next. He sat down. Okay. They would have become so quiet. What was that? You know, they became so quiet. And that they all watching Jesus. Their eyes were fixed on Jesus. And what is he going to say next? Okay. And he said this. Today, the scripture I have read has happened. Has been fulfilled. In other words, well, the, the, the one that the scripture is talking about, that's me. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. I am. So initially, the Bible says people all spoke well of him. They praised him. Wow, because they heard also, they heard what Jesus did in other towns in Jerusalem, the Capernaum, in other towns, you know, uh, uh, performing miracles, healing the sick. Okay. So initially, they really welcomed Jesus as, as one of their own. You know, this is a guy from the, uh, from the same town. You know, this is a local guy. Okay. So initially, they welcomed him. They liked him. They, they really, they were happy to see Jesus in the town. But as soon as Jesus said, today the scripture I have read has happened, I am the one, okay? And uh, they start uh, saying things like, isn't this the Joseph's son? We know that his father, I mean, we know his mother, we know his brothers and sisters. He is the Joseph's son, Joseph the carpenter, so he's the carpenter. They only saw Jesus <coughs> as the son of Joseph, the carpenter not the Son of God, the Christ. Okay. So you see, they, they, the, the people of Nazareth, they were so familiar with Jesus. They grew up together, some of them. They used to play together. They used to go to school together. You know, They used to meet each other every day. They were so familiar with Jesus. But they only knew Jesus as the son of the Joseph, the carpenter, not as the Son of God, the Christ. And as Jesus revealed his true identity, I am the one, you know, I am the one here to preach the good news and to set the people free and so on. They weren't really happy. Okay? So what happens next is they they became furious. They became furious. Okay? And so they so yes, they became furious. Initially they were happy, but they were furious. And so now that they go to the next one, they 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 drive they drove him uh, you know, outside and they bring him to the edge of the cliff and about to throw him off the cliff okay, because they were so furious uh, but the story ends that Jesus went right through uh, you know right through them okay he just moved on and so he didn't really perform many miracles in Nazareth because people didn't believe not that he didn't have, have didn't have power but because they didn't believe they didn't believe so he moved on to Capernaum and other towns and uh, you know doing amazing things up in other towns in Galilee but not in not in Nazareth, because people didn't believe in him as the Son of God, as <coughs> So 
children. I'm sure this morning you will have a lot of you know interesting discussion in your Bible class, but this is one thing that I really want to tell you. If you are only familiar with Jesus, but not really knowing him as your Lord and Savior, you can make the same mistake like the people of Nazareth, like my own sister. Now, if you really know, you know, just like this, it's like this. So maybe you have a friend, you have friends, okay? And this friend you meet just once a week. And this friend you meet every day. Obviously, this is closer, this is a more intimate, isn't it? And so, when we, when we know Jesus, when we know God, you want to spend time with Him. You want to know more about Him. And that's why we love the Bible, we read the Bible. Because I know Jesus, I love Jesus, I want to know more about Him. I want to spend time with him. Okay. And uh, you need to ask yourself if you spend more time with your phone every day and not really wanting to read the Bible because you know, that sounds boring and that's boring and uh, it's more fun to spend more time on the phone. You need to ask yourself, do I really know Jesus? Or am I just familiar with Jesus and just dread to come to church because my friends my, my parents, uh, you know, forced me uh, to do. It's a very important question, okay? And uh, so I hope that the, uh, you, know, you have a great discussion as you go to the uh, uh, Bible class this morning. But uh, the key is really not only to be familiar with Jesus, but to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, pray, Lord, for our children and youth, that they, they are not just familiar with Jesus, the stories of the Bible, and what happens in church, and they are not just forced to come to church on Sunday. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in their lives and touch their lives and speak to them. And Lord, we know they are capable of all those spiritual understanding and intimate relationship with you. So Lord, would you open their hearts, would you speak to them? So they can really know you as the Lord and Savior. They can grow in their relationship with you. So whatever happens in their lives in the future, they will continue to serve you, worship you, and love you and follow. Thank you, Jesus. Bless their, bless their Bible class this morning. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 Would you like to stand? journey uh, this town and as the first part of the course we looked at the uh, story of the two uh, sons better known as the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son uh, from Luke 15 uh, last Sunday. The younger son took away part of the family fortune and squandered everything in a foreign country and uh, as he spent everything very unwisely uh, the family struck in that country and so he was just hoping now to survive and uh, he hired himself out to look after uh, pigs which was one of the most unclean animals uh, as far as the Jews was uh, concerned and, and so he was basically you know, looking for food that the pigs were eating you know the garbage you know just looking searching around the garbage and trying to eat trying to feed himself uh, with the uh, food uh, the pigs were eating. I think we have a similar similar modern day equivalent at the moment uh, in Venezuela, for example. You know, as you watch the, uh, the news every day, because of the political economic mismanagement in the country, uh, even though this is an oil rich country, people are starving, literally, according to the news, you know, news report. And they are literally picking up, picking up food, whatever food scraps available in the uh, rubbish uh, bin, which is shocking which is terrible. And uh, uh, so that's, that's what's going on in, in you know, countries like uh, Venezuela. So perhaps that was, you know, that, was the, uh, that was what's happening, what's going on for this young man uh, uh, as, he, as he lost everything, as he blew away everything. 
And so Jesus is really trying to describe something that is worst possible uh, imaginable, worst scenario imaginable. Okay, uh, you can't really in, in that culture. It is very hard to add anything worse than that. Okay, uh, wasted everything, squandered everything, and tried to feed himself with this pig's food pots. Okay, uh, and, uh, and and he realized finally he came to his senses. Uh, he decided to return home, thinking that he doesn't deserve to be called uh, uh, you know, as a father's son anymore. So he wanted to ask the father, beg the father to accept him as one of the one of the servants. But as soon as the father saw the son, the younger son, he ran towards him. He put on him a robe, a ring, a pair of sandals, which is very symbolic of, uh, you know, being completely restored as as a son uh, again. And the ring signifies that the father has actually entrusted this young man once again uh, with the authority and power to carry out the family business. You know, this is the one. This is the this is the one who blew away the, the family fortune, the family wealth. But the uh, father trusts him once again, entrusts him, uh, and, and giving him this ring so he can carry out the family business. He has the power and authority, and that is an amazing. Now today, we want to look at another story, uh, another heartwarming story of grace in Matthew chapter 10. So if you turn to Matthew 20, uh, turn with me to Matthew uh, 20, we're going to read the passage uh, together, Matthew 20, verses 1 to uh, 16. This is a parable of the workers in the vineyard, another uh, uh, you know, well-known story, Matthew 20, verses 1 to uh, 16. So let's read this together. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long, doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Uh, these men who were hired the last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us. Who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Uh, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired the last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So this landowner, hires workers early in the morning. This is about sunrise, maybe six, six o'clock in the morning. And he promised them to give a denarius for a day's work. And then he, he went out a little late. He went out a couple more times, uh, the third hour, the sixth hour, which is nine o'clock and the 12 o'clock. And he invites them to come and work in his uh, vineyard. And finally, he went out one more time, which is at the 11th hour, uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, just an hour before the day, you know, the, the, the day was uh, uh, to uh, to finish. Uh, so he invited him to come and work in his uh, vineyard. And after the day, the day's work was over, uh, starting with the last one who came, he pays a denarii, uh, the same amount, the same wage to each uh, person. And so the workers who were hired initially early in the morning, uh, they were expecting, you know, some, some something more although they were promised to, to be paid one denarius. So they were expecting, but they, were, they received uh, one denarius, uh, as, as, you know, as the country goes. And then they began to grumble. 
uh, they were angry, they were disappointed. Uh, and so the landowner replied, well, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Don't you, didn't you agree to work for Denarius? And then he said uh, in, in verse 15, I'm reading from Revised Standard Version. He said, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So he used the word generosity. The landowner was generous. He was generous to those who came to work uh, late. Okay. So the key, the key in this story is what you receive from God. The landowner represents God. What you receive from God is determined by His generosity, not by our heart work. Okay. So what we receive from God is determined by His generosity, not by our hard work. And that is grace. So uh, those who hired at the, at the 11th hour didn't deserve at all to receive uh, a full denarii. They just worked for an hour at the maximum. Uh, but they received a denarii uh, nonetheless. And also, the reason why they were hanging around in the marketplace all day long doing nothing was because, you know, no one, no one picked them up. No one wanted to, uh, to bring them into their vineyard. So they didn't deserve, in many ways, they didn't deserve to receive a full denarius. Uh, but the landowner, the generous landowner, the gracious landowner, uh, paid them a denarius anyway. What we receive from God is determined by His grace, by his generosity, not by our hard work, and that is grace. Uh, and, and so if you go back to the story of the two sons that we looked at last week, the younger son, the younger son, he, had, he abandoned the place of grace and privilege as the son. He walked away from the relationship with the father. Uh, he, went, you know, he went to a distant country. He squandered everything. So he physically left home. Uh, on the other hand, the, the elder son, the elder son, he didn't physically leave home, but his heart was his heart was far from the father, either as well. Okay, and uh, so it wasn't just the younger son who removed himself from the position of intimacy, the joy of being with the father uh, at home. The elder son also, although physically he he still he was still in the house, okay, with with the father in the house, but in his heart internally. Inwardly, he was away from the father. So we saw that last last uh, week. It wasn't just the younger son, uh, but also the elder son as well. Uh, his heart was far away from the father, and the elder son represents the religious people. And so, if you've been a Christian for a while, uh, we are we are in danger of becoming you know something like the elder son. Uh, thinking that uh, you know everything we do, work hard, serve hard, and do things, and 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 that will earn the father's approval. That will make the father uh, happy. Uh, but before all that, just being a son, uh, just being the son of the father, that gave uh, you know the delight and and the joy to the father. It's interesting, isn't it? That the elder son, uh, he's not inside a home. He's actually in the field. Which is, a, which is a dishonorable place for the elder son to be. The elder son is supposed to be the heir to the, you know, to the father. He's supposed to be in the house with the father, exercising all the authority and power and enjoying the favor of the father. So he has to be right in the middle of the house, uh, beside, beside the father. But he's out in the field, uh, you know, looks like identifying, identifying with the workers, with the servants of the field. And he actually said, I've been slaying away for you. I've been slaving away. Okay. So, uh, whereas the younger son physically away from the father, but the elder son physically in the house, but internally he was also away from the father's heart. He was just thinking, he was just thinking by doing, you know, working hard, by working hard, I can, I can ask the father's blessing. I can ask for the father's uh, 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 favor. Okay. So that is wrong thinking. The elder son's thinking was wrong, okay, and that was the kind of thinking the religious people uh, had, and uh, so Jesus is really uh, saying that's you know that's that's not that's not right, okay. Now, having said that, having said all that, it is important to understand 
We are not saying our uh, action, what we do, is not important. As we are talking about grace of God, we are not saying what we do is not important. They are very important. They are very important. Of course they are important. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, at the end of the world, uh, everything we did on earth will be tested. And God will send fire, and the fire will test. So it's like a building. Everything we did is like a building. We are building a house. We are building. Okay. Uh, so in our lifetime, we've been building something. Uh, and, and so at, at the end of the day, before God, uh, you know, on the, on the day of judgment, uh, everything will be tested. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 onwards, it says, If any man builds on this foundation, the foundation is Christ. So if any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with the fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So we all have, as Christians, we all have the foundation. The foundation is the Christ. And you have the foundation, and you need to, you need to build something. And some people, they build uh, using uh, the materials like uh, gold, silver, and costly stones, okay, which, is, which is enduring, uh, enduring which has eternal significance. But other people, they use wood, hay, and straw, which, which, which doesn't endure, which cannot survive the fire. So at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, there will be the fire testing our, the quality of our building, the quality of each man's work. And of course, if your house is, 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 a, is a made of uh, wood, hay, and straw, there's no chance that will survive the fire. You know, everything will be everything will be burned down. Okay. But if your house is made of gold, silver, and costly stones, it will survive. Okay. So, so what we do, you know, so we're talking about the foundation, on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We are all saved. We are children of God. But then we are we are we are building something. So what we do after being saved is very important. So we are not saying what we do isn't uh, important. And, uh, and, and yeah, so, the, so, so what, what, what are the gold, silver, and costly stones? And what are the wood, hay, and straw? Well, the wood, hay, and straw are the ones that, that were done uh, uh, in your own strength. Okay. Uh, you, do, you do the church work, or you do, you know, you do you know, everything in your life in your own strength, in your own wisdom, uh, for, for, your, for your glory, and to make yourself look good. Just like the Pharisees in the, in, the, in, the, in the story. The Pharisees were praying hard. They were you know, the fasting a couple of days a week. They were giving tithes and giving the offering. And, but often they were praying at the street corners because they wanted to be seen by the people. And so they want to look good. They want to sound holy. Uh, so so, so, so you know, although they look, they, they, they're building something. You know, it looks like they are building something. But it is, it is a wood, hay, and straw. They, they wouldn't survive. They wouldn't endure the, the test of the fire at the end of the day. What are, what are uh, gold, silver, and costly stones there? Well, everything you do in the strength of God. Everything you do with humility uh, for the glory of God. And, and you know, everything you, you, you do, you, you, want to, uh, you want to fulfill the plan and the purpose of God. And that's like a gold, silver, and costly stones. And that will survive. That will have eternal uh, significance. Okay, so we are not saying what we do in this life is not important. They are very important. Uh, you know, they, they have they have eternal significance, one way or another. Now, now Paul Paul makes it very clear that this is this is not about salvation issue. Okay, we are all saved. Whether whether you have a wood uh, uh, wood hay and straw, you are saved. Okay, uh, gold, silver, uh, costly stones. You are saved, uh, but it, it says at the end of you know that passage. It says, if it is bound up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the 
flame. So you turn up before God and you have these uh, you know, stinged uh, eyebrows because you know, everything is almost gone and then you say, phew, I just made it. You know, I just escaped it. Okay? So that's like the kind of salvation you have. Okay? But if you have gold uh, and, and, and costly stones, you know, safe and, safe and secure. Okay? So it is, we are not talking about salvation here. We're talking about reward. We're talking about the eternal significance. Okay? Romans 8, 1, Paul said, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. If you truly are in Christ Jesus, you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, no condemnation. Okay? Even, the, even the, uh, one of the robbers on, the, on, on one side of the cross, he did nothing, nothing good. Uh, but at that last moment, as he accepted Jesus, he was saved. He was in paradise. Okay, so there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But what about the commendation? Or the commendation? No condemnation, but what about commendation? When you go to heaven, uh, when you stand before God, there will be any commendation, any praise, any reward from God. So that's what we are uh, talking about uh, here. And uh, will the things we do in this life actually be of any value for eternity we need to ask the question every day don't we you know and as we spend our money as we plan for the future as we make decisions important decisions like buying houses and you know, and, you know, and, you know finding a job so, and then sending our kids to schools and universities so everything we do we need to ask this question will the things i do in this life at this moment actually be of any value for eternity will it be silver gold silver and costly stones am i building with gold silver and costly stones or am i just using wood hay and straw okay so this is a very important question will the things i do in this life we do in our family actually be of any value for eternity well that was the precisely the question i was baffled with uh, as, as, a, as a young young teenage Christian at the age of 18. Up until then, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really understand the, you know, the, the concept of grace. And it was very much about religious activity. So up until then, without understanding the grace of God, everything was about me becoming successful, famous and influential, rich. That was my aim, my sole aim. That was my aim, you know, that I, I wanted to go to university because I wanted to be successful and famous, rich. But after understanding, experiencing the grace of God in a really tangible way and, and, and changing and transforming my, my life, I couldn't stay the same way. And, and this is the precise little question that I began to ask myself as a young man, as a young Christian, teenage young Christian. Will the things I do that I'm going to do in the future uh, actually have any eternal significance? And so I had to answer the question, and you know, I, and, and so becoming a pastor was my answer to that question. And, but we all have different answers, okay. And so uh, the religious people thought their religious works were good in themselves, okay. But uh, uh, and, and but often they try to impress other people, uh, and and so Jesus said, "Well, you have received your reward already, man's approval." If you try and do things, you know, to impress other people in your own strength, you have received your reward already. Okay. So, uh, uh, and so, you know, do you think when you look at someone, when you look at someone, somebody is really working hard, it seems he's working hard, she's working hard, say, you know, in church, for example, okay, do you think you can recognize uh, that he's building it silver and gold or wood and straw? Do you think you can recognize, do, do you think you can distinguish well, we can't. We can't. Because on the outside, when you look at on the outside, you can't really, you can't really decide. You can't really see. Because even Jesus said, many will say uh, to me, uh, say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we, did we not prophesy in your name and, and uh, in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, Jesus said, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. Okay. So on this outside, Two people can do exactly the same thing, coming to church, serving in the church, you know, praying, reading the Bible, uh, and, and the helping the poor. So two people can do exactly the same thing, but they may end up in different uh, 
uh, position later. Mm -hmm. So it, it, is not, it is not just about the outward activity. It is very much on the inside. The elder son, he was okay on the outside. He was working hard. You know, he always kept the rule, played by the rule. But on the inside, his heart was far away from the father. He didn't really understand the gracious heart of the father. He didn't join the party when the younger son, when the younger brother came in. He was angry. He was he was furious. He was rejecting uh, his uh, younger brother. And so, just imagine in your mind these two pictures. Okay, these two pictures. Uh, and uh, the first picture uh, of the younger son is one who just returned to his father and uh, he's just smelly, he's broken, he's dirty and he just collapsed on the arms of his father. Okay. He is forgiven, he's accepted, he's welcomed into the family but he's a still smelly, dirty, broken kid. Uh, so he knew, he knew that he was forgiven, but he also aware that he's a dirty, smelly, and broken. And sometimes, Christians, we see ourselves like that. That's the kind of picture we have. Yes, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, 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 I received Jesus, and uh, I, I came back to the Father, the Father God, and I'm forgiven. But you still see yourself on the inside, I'm like a dirty, smelly, broken person. I'm no good. So very often Christians see themselves forgiven, but sinner, forgiven sinner. Okay, so I'm no good. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether I can do this because I'm, you know, I'm smelly, I'm dirty, I'm broken. So that's one image, that's one picture. Okay, and the other picture of the second, uh, the, the the younger son is this: uh, a son, a younger son, the younger son with robe, uh, the ring, and the sandals. Okay. Yes, he knows that he, he made a mistake, terrible mistake. He blew everything away. And, but as he came back, he's a forgiven. And he also knows he's a restored. He's a restored. So he's not dirty, smelly, broken anymore. He's restored. So he has this, this authority, this privilege, this blessing, this power. Okay? He can use the ring. He can exercise authority and power. He can carry out the father's business. He has this robe. Instantly recognizable wherever he goes, in the house, outside. You know, people can see that well, this, is the, this is the son of the father. Okay? And he has a sandals. He can go wherever he wanted uh, as, as a son of the father. Okay? So very different, different uh, picture. So, you know, between these two pictures, one who is a forgiven, who returned home, who is a saved, uh, you know, who received a grace and yet still seeing himself as dirty, broken, smelly uh, person. Or one who is forgiven, uh, who is restored and fully restored and uh, understanding who he is now. Uh, and so he's ready to exercise uh, his power and authority. So that's the two pictures. Which picture do you have in your mind as you look at yourself? Which is the image, the kind of image you have, uh, you know, as a Christian? Okay. Well, that was the really the key message from the Freedom in Christ course that we did the last time. We spent ten weeks in asking this question, in discussing, in thinking about this because of so many people, they, you know, the kind of image they have is the first picture, the first picture. Okay, uh, but the Bible doesn't, you know, that that's not the Bible. What what the Bible teaches. The Bible says you are the holy ones, you are the saints, you are righteous, you, you, you are justified. Okay. So we need to have the second picture. Uh, you know, it, it's very hard to believe. I, I mean, we understand it's very hard to believe because you are acutely aware of your past failures. But that's, that's the Father's heart. That's the Father's plan. And that's, that's what the Bible uh, teaches. So we need to move on from the first picture to the second picture picture. If you stay in the first picture, you can't do very much. Because you're always thinking, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a forgiven sinner. I'm, I'm smelly, dirty. You know, who am I? You know, I you know, what, you know, what can I do? Okay. You always have this lack of confidence. And you can't really move forward. But if you have the second picture, uh, yes, yes, you know, you know your failure. You are humble. You have this humility. You have this sincerity. You have this gratitude. But you are also courageous, confident, to go on and fulfill uh, the position 
uh, our son. And that's the Father's wish. That's what Father uh, wants. Because we are completely restored uh, to the position as the Father. And um, so it's like, uh, you know, the Good Friday and the Easter Sunday. For many Christians, they just remain, they just stuck with the Good Friday. And they say, well, Jesus died for my sins. Praise God, you know. And uh, so I'm saved, I'm forgiven. So even if I die tonight, I can go to heaven because all my sins are forgiven. Okay. But that's Good Friday. After Good Friday, there's an Easter Sunday. And every year we, we celebrate Easter Sunday. But what do you celebrate? Why are we celebrating uh, Easter Sunday? Yes, Jesus rose again from the dead. But as Jesus rose again from the dead, we also rose again from the dead. You know, as you are baptized into the water, you, you come out. It means you, you rose again from the dead. So we also rose again from the dead. And Jesus ascended into the heaven. We also ascended into heaven. Jesus sitting right beside of the Father. We also sit beside the Father. And so we have this power and authority. And uh, we have given, we haven't been given this power and authority. Okay? And so we need to use those authority and power. And so that's the second uh, picture. So what we do, what we do, uh, what we do come from who we are. It is important to understand who we are. Okay, just imagine what this, what this son will do from the understanding of who he is. And this son, the same son, but this picture, okay, what he can do from the understanding of who he is. And so understanding what, uh, who we are is very important. Uh, and as you, when you know, when you know who you are, and, uh, and when you know the kind of grace that you have received, naturally, you want to serve God. Naturally, you know, you want to do things for God. Okay, there was a, there was a story which is a, which is a very, uh, uh, very heartwarming. And uh, this, this is a guy, who was, uh, who was in the mental institution. And so for many years, he was, in, he was suffering, he was struggling you know, in the mental institution. He had a lot of you know, uh, uh, issues in his life. And so he was given, he was given the uh, Freedom in Christ course DVD. So in the, in the hospital, he, he, he watched it, he went through the book and the course himself. Uh, so he was really transformed through the teaching uh, from, from the course. And, uh, and, but then he also made a mistake, you know, he, he got into sexual sins, he had a relationship with this young lady, and he realized that was wrong. Uh, and, and so, you know, through the counseling, he, he renounced that, he, he gave up, okay? And then he said, this is what he said, I used to think God was, God was a guy with a big stick, but now I know that he loves me. The reason I want to stop sinning is because I don't want to keep hurting someone who loves me so much. The reason why we want to keep the word of God, the command of God, is not because if I don't, he will punish me. And I'm just afraid of the fact, you know, God. So that's why I keep, you know, coming to church, paying the tithes and, uh, you know, serving and whatever, whatever we do, because I'm afraid of, of, of God. No. He said, uh, you know, I, that's, uh, that's how I used, to, I used to think he's a guy with a big stick. But now I, I know he loves me. So the reason I want to stop sinning, I want to serve him, is because I don't want to keep hurting someone who loves me so much. If you know that God loves you so much, you don't want to hurt him. You don't want to hurt God. You don't want to offend God. You want to love him and you want to serve him. You want to praise him and you want to bless him. And you want to bless other people. Okay? You know the, uh, the, the word slave, the, the, the elders have used the word slave, slaving away. Okay? Uh, and and uh, uh, in the in the Roman times there were many slaves. There were so many slaves. Okay, uh, so many many slaves. But then sometimes after uh, some years the slave the slaves will be set free. That the, maybe the master is a good master, and uh, the master calls him. Okay, come come here. Uh, you've been working so hard, you know, for the last twenty years or so, uh, or so. So I want to set you free. Go. You are now free. So there are many cases slaves who've been working very hard. They were set free. Okay. And they went on to start their business and became wealthy, and they, they were fully fledged uh, Roman citizens. Okay. So there were many slaves who were set free in those days. But also some cases, those slaves, they wanted to stay on because their master was a good master. Okay. And so, so thank you, master. 
uh, thank you for your generosity and uh, I, I accept your heart but I want to stay on may I stay on in your household I want to continue to serve you because I love you master uh, I, I so appreciate your, your, your generosity so can I continue to serve you uh, in, in your household and it wasn't uncommon in those days some slaves they wanted to stay on even though they had a right to leave you know they had a freedom but they chose before they had no choice they had no freedom they were forced to do you know whatever whatever they had to do in the, in the, in the house but now they chose they chose uh, you know it was their free choice and, and and to do you know whatever whatever is necessary in the house so on the outside when you see uh, these slaves they may look the same you know, you, you, you go and you, you know, you're farming in the, in, in the field and maybe you're cooking, you're cleaning and you, you do all the things. See, on the outside, they may look very similar, but there's a huge difference, okay, between a slave who is forced to do everything in the household and a slave who chose to do everything in the house because this slave loves the master. And that is the kind of slave uh, Paul is using. Uh, Romans 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. That's slave. Okay. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. So he's, he doesn't mean I'm a slave. I'm forced to preach the gospel. I'm forced to help the church. I'm forced to look after people. That's not what he's saying. Okay. I'm a slave my, by my choice, by my free choice. I'm a slave. Okay, I'm absolutely free, but I chose to do these things. I'm a, a, a poor, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. And also, uh, Mark uh, chapter 10, verse 45, whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. That's what Jesus said. Again, okay, it is uh, becoming a slave by our free uh, choice. So when you when you when you appreciate the grace of God and and uh, uh, the generosity of God, uh, you want to serve God, almost like a slave by free choice. And and one John chapter four verse nineteen, we love because He first loved us. Matthew ten, we give freely because we have received freely. Luke six, we are merciful because He has been merciful. Ephesians four, we forgive because we have been forgiven. So we do all those things because we received God's grace and uh, we want to serve God and serve His people by our free choice. Amen. Amen. Well, that's, the, uh, that's a, the, just the part of the uh, uh, today's session. I can't cover everything. Uh, and, and so the rest, you know, there, there will be the DVD and testimonies in the, in the grace groups uh, on Thursday evening and Friday morning. So can I encourage you to come? We had an amazing time last week. So you, you can, you're still welcome to come and join us. Okay. So do you remember the, the verse that I showed you on the PowerPoint last Sunday? Let me just finish with this. Uh, John 14, 15. Jesus said, If you love me, you will obey my commands. There are two ways of reading this verse. Okay, One is, if you love me, you will obey my commands. You have no choice. You are forced to obey. Or, if you love me, You, will, you, you want to, you will want to obey my commands. If you love me, you will obey my commands. When you understand the love of God and the grace of God, that's what you want to do. You're not forced to do anymore. You chose to do. You want to. May the Lord bless us and that will be our heart's desire. Uh, as we as we serve God and serve the church. Amen. Amen. Would you like to all stand together, please? Let's sing a song and uh, pray accordingly. I think there was a song about the, uh, the sun. Is it the uh, sun set you free? All of us.
so we become grace people. We exercise grace to one another. And on the 11th hour, Walker didn't desire at all to receive this full denarii, but you have given him uh, nonetheless. God, you have given us so much. We have received every spiritual blessing in heaven. And uh, Lord, help us to operate in this week, in our family, in our workplace, in our church, with the petition of the second picture being restored completely as your son and daughter again. Hallelujah. Fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we bless one another by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all throughout this week and forever.